most of the downstream analysis that we do, even the even positions, positions probably not used to be either. So any downstream analysis in the field we have to do. Yeah, but most of our methods are ready to go. Hi folks, I think we're ready to go. Sorry, it's pretty busy. There might not even be chairs for everyone, which is crazy and awesome. Thank you all for coming. Uh, so the first thing I'd like to do is thank uh, Venture Labs for this space. They graciously offered us the, the space this evening. So can we get a round of applause for them, please? Uh, part of that appreciation is going to be expressed through signing into the book that's going to be coming around, starting with Matt up here. It's going to be paper and pen tonight. If you're used to a, an iPad, we're going low tech. <laughs> So it'll come around, sign in you with your name or a fake name, your company or a fake company. It doesn't matter, it's more about the count at this point, just to express just how many people were here. This is a really large group, so please put your name there so it shows up. Next thing is the thing that led to all the technical difficulties is the live stream that Charles is managing for us tonight. Thank you, Charles. Claps for Charles. So if you can't make it to the next one, it'll be live streamed. So just look it up. It's uh, posted in the meetup and on the Vantex Slack, all the links. Uh, the next thing is the microphones. We have a Q&A session after each talk that lasts about 10 minutes. Because we have a live stream, it needs to be mic'd. So just yelling out your question won't be good enough. So me and Matt will be running around with two mics and handing them to you, and if you get one, we'll basically motion whether you're following or ready to go with your question. Uh, after that, we'll have some talks. It'll go fast, we'll have some questions, it'll go fast, and then after that, we'll be going to Rogue. If you look out the window, you can actually see their sign on Waterfront. So just follow the crowd to Waterfront and have some dinner and drinks with us. And last thing, well, next to last thing, uh, we're looking for speakers for next time. We already have one. We need three more. So if you're interested in giving a lightning talk, it'll probably be a month to two months from now, date to be determined. Come and talk to me or Matt. Put up your hand, Matt. Thank you. Last thing, uh, this is part of a data science series of lectures. So tomorrow night is the Kaggle, what is, what's it called, Matt? I learned data science by doing Kaggle competitions. I don't go to it. Uh, <laughs> I can't make it. Wow. <laughs> and a week from now uh, is the advanced paper reading group. So same, same building, floor up, same time. So uh, without further ado, we'll let Robin get to his talk. Maybe give us a brief intro of yourself and then get into it. Thanks so much. Uh, my name is Robin Chauhan. I uh, work for AgFunder, a VC in San Francisco focused on ag tech and food tech. I'm um, head of engineering there. And um, I'm going to be talking to you about OpenAI, GPT today, and related models. So what's the point of these type of models? The point is that with a small number of labeled examples, we can uh, get really great performance. Now, this is um, text processing, natural language processing. So the uh, GPT paper says, the goal is to learn a universal representation that can uh, handle many tasks. So the idea is uh, there's heavy um, pre-training uh, before we get the model, and then we download that model, and we do some small fine-tuning ourselves for the, our specific case. You can see heavy means like uh, extremely expensive pre-training and very cheap uh, fine-tuning. So it's called, uh, some people say this is like the ImageNet moment for, um, for text. The idea with ImageNet was that you can, you can download uh, models that are pre-trained with ImageNet, and then you can uh, easily customize them for your, for your image task. So this is like an analogous thing for, for NLP. Um, so you download a fat, happy network, pre-trained, and then you fine tune for freshness. Now GPT-2 takes that further with zero, <coughs> zero shot performance, and we'll talk about that soon. So this is a slide from Jan Kuhn, and he talks about how uh, unsupervised uh, learning is like most of the cake. Uh, and then the, the supervised learning is like icing on top. And he says, the next AI revolution, people have been talking about this for a while, the next AI revolution is really going to be about super, uh, unsupervised, and that's where we are right now. With 
notice he says with very large networks, and he wasn't kidding about that. So is Peekaboo really the secret to AGI? Sounds ridiculous. Um, that, that's another slide from Yon Le Kuhn. Um, so what he's saying is, if you have data, um, you can just hide some of it and have your model predict that data. And if you do that in the right way and enough volume, your, your model starts to really understand the structure of your data very well. It's playing peekaboo and predicting what's, what's being hidden. It's actually, you really need to understand um, your data in great detail to do that correctly. So he's saying you can do that. There's many different ways you can do that. Uh, so this is a family of models, um, and GPT is down here. And before GPT, we had um, ULMFIT from uh, Fast AI guys, uh, Elmo, and these, up here these are all like LSTM based. And then with GPT, um, they started to move to transformer based. So we got rid of the RNNs, the LSTMs. And uh, now we're in, uh, using transformers for all these GPT, BERT, GPT-2, and then there's, there's other models that follow after that. So that's kind of the new the thing, is, is leaving the else teams behind. So GPT is a, a model that's trained on text corpses. So what it does is it, it is reading text and trying to predict the next word. Very large amounts of text. So in this case, books corpus, 7,000 books. It read and predicted the next word uh, for the whole thing. And through that, it's understanding the, the structure of the text. Um, it, importantly, the pre-trained text was very long text. So we got to start to understand the longer term structure, not just, like in the Markov chain, you're just looking at a very small uh, distance. But with um, GPT, it, it considers longer uh, structure as well. So what it's really doing is, uh, uh, up here we say, it's maximizing this likelihood, basically, maximizing the probability of, of predicting the next word correctly. And the really the whole structure of the thing is described in this section right here. It's really quite simple. Its simplicity is one of the most surprising things about it. Um, so it's based on a transformer. And this is the original transformer. Um, GPT is a little different because it actually only uses this part. It only uses self-attention, where the transformer has, um, has an encoder and a decoder. Uh, so so it's, a, it's a modified version of, of the transformer. For more information on the trans, oh, that's on the, the next slide. But uh, there's a, the transformer has now been um, superseded by a universal transformer. So you can expect that um, that, that line of research will continue. Um, there's uh, this is a lightning talk, so I'm just going to speak through this. Uh, can I just sit here? OK, that's fine. So this, if you want to know more about um, the transformer, which is important for understanding these types of models, uh, I would suggest this video here that explains attention is all you need. Um, and that can get you, get you started. But uh, these types of models, um, they, they're really heavy with compute. Uh, the, the computation needed grows as a square is order n squared. And so in GPT, it's, it, it, it can, GPT-2 can read in up to uh, like 1,000 tokens and BERT up to 500 at a time. So it's, not, it's considering that much context before the current work. Whereas with RNN, it's, uh, uh, there's multi-step back propagation. OK, let's get more specific. So with the GPT transformer here, you see there's, there isn't the two branches. They're just the decoder. And then for the different types of tasks, it's that transformer is used in different ways. Um, but the key here is that for, the, for all these very different types of tasks, it's a very similar structure. Very little customization is done for each of the tasks. So the, um, the input and output is, is not actually words or letters. It uses this byte pair encoding, which is kind of almost like a Huffman, really? yeah. Huffman encoding. <laughs> and so you can see here from a debug session, you're seeing that there's, it, it's built this vocabulary. And that's, that's what it's using for the for, um, Now, BERT is another model in, in this family. Um, and the difference with BERT is it actually, it's, it's not just the context for BERT is not just the past tokens that have come through. It also considers the future tokens. So, um, and, and this is done by, um, so you can see it's not, the, the, the arrows are not causal. It's, only, it's not only looking at the tokens from the past. From the past. 
Uh, BERT is a model that it was based on GPT design. GPT is from OpenAI, BERT is from Google. Um, but they, they actually chose it specifically to be as close to GPT as possible to compare it. But there's some important differences. Robin? Sorry. I think I'm going to enforce lightning talk time. <laughs> okay. Um, so with BERT, the pre training tasks <laughs> are. Um, <laughs> are uh, Can we move on to the questions, BERT? Oh, all right. Uh, yay. Nothing's going to make sense at this point, but okay. This um, is what happens sometimes with lightning talks. What do we think, audience? Do we want them to finish, or do we want to enforce lightning talk? Hands up if you want them to finish. All right. <laughs> cool. Okay, I'll, I'll be as fast as I can. So with BERT, instead of just predicting the next word, is a, is a different task in mind. You, they're, they're masking out certain words, and they're trying to predict those specific words. And then they have another task. So this is, this is the unsupervised part, um, where they have two sentences and they're, they're, um, the model's predicting whether this, the sentence A comes after sentence B. So in every case, these unsupervised models have some kind of bullshit task you don't care about that prepares them for the task you do care about. Now, GPT-2 is a totally different thing in the sense that it's so powerful, it can, it can solve these NLP problems in a zero-shot contest. That means it, it doesn't even know what the task is and it's already solving it. It's a very general, it's a, uh, and the title of the paper was Language Models Are Unsupervised multitask learning. That's actually a really powerful statement if you understand what you're saying there. Um, so GPT-2 is a much larger model than GPT, and it's trained a lot more text, and it's incredibly good at generating really good text. Um, so here it's, it's showing how, uh, this is saying that um, it can, it, in some cases it can translate into French uh, without ever being trained on that, just by having read a whole bunch of the internet. Um, this slide I'm, I'm going to skip, except for just to say that there's different uh, sizes of, of these models. In this case, GPT um, has small and large versions uh, with different performance characteristics, and of course, the larger ones need a lot of data to run. So this is GPT-2, um, and here it's being asked all these questions. It's never been trained on any of these questions. It's just read the internet, and it's uh, able to answer these questions. Now, it's not getting all right. But it's doing incredibly well considering that it's never been trained on any of this stuff. And it's even been confirmed that none of these questions appear directly in the text. <coughs> That's pretty incredible. So look at this. This is input. This is one input case where you, the, the way it works is you can provide a context. You provide some text and it continues the text. So if you can you just start to read this, this is the text uh, written by the GP large. And this is, this is the text about our, our data science lightning talk rules. And I got GPT to continue those rules. You can say it's suggesting for each lecture, two slides should be provided, no single slide. For each session, two presentations should be. I mean, it's a little bit bullshitty because this is a small GPT version. If it was provided to a large one, you, I think you'd probably like the, some of the rules. Uh, and then here is the, the controversy is uh, they didn't release the large one because it's so powerful. If, if you look at this slide, the text on the left is from the full one. Um, people aren't very happy about that. You can see from GitHub. Uh, but they're saying that um, this can be, it's so powerful, it can be used for all these malicious purposes. So they won't release it. On the, um, on the left, you can see uh, GPT making a, uh, writing an essay about why recycling is bad. So you can see how this could be used to spam the internet with the type of stuff we don't need on the internet. Uh, GPT-2 is just one in the long series. Uh, they're literally talking about going all the way to GPT-20. Uh, given the power of GPT-2, GPT-20, God knows what it could do. Um, but they're serious about pursuing this. Uh, so you, you, you can expect to see a whole line of, of models coming after this. That's all I have. Thank you. All right. Any questions? Do you, you want? I have a question. Hit the button. It's got to turn green. Uh, does the GP2 model have application computer vision that they generate? It's not on. Should have a green light. Does the GP2 model uh, have application in computer vision, like the generating images or videos and stuff? Can it be modified to do that? Or is this... So it, it, it started with text. They made a version to, for music, so it can understand and produce music. Um, these things are, are sequential, right? Yeah. So um, it may make sense to do video, uh, like some of the variation for video. I don't think it's been extended in that way. But yeah, you, I think anything where it's a, a series of, you're generating kind of a sequential. Yeah. So a 
lot of the examples that I saw were a sequence to sequence, sequence to sequence prediction. So you give it a sequence of text, and it's going to give you a sequence of what it thinks follows that text. Um, is there any case where you've seen it applied to like a classification problem? Yeah, totally. Um, it can. I mean, BERT is the is like a variant of it that can be is the best at classification right now. The BERT series. Um, GPT can be used in that way, and it can be used. GPT two can be used directly. Um, just by outputting, like uh, they, they couch the question in a way that it can it can comfortably output the, in the answer, um, or or you can add um, extra layers on the end, like you might do with with an, a pre-trained image now. Uh, actually, sorry, that, that was not it. That, that was a multi choice. Classification, here we go. Uh, any other questions? Um, what, what is the training data here? You just said the internet. Oh. Ah, yeah, it's um, a huge amount of text. So the, the properties of the model depend on what kind of text. And what you can do is you can download it today and run it on your own text. For example, I downloaded it and then uh, ran it, uh, continued training on uh, one act plays. And then it starts writing plays. Or I, or I train it on some poems, and it starts writing in a style of poems. Ansha? Uh, I can't remember if this was a couple of months ago oh. I was reading about it, but who decided that it's not that not, it's not for release? Well, it's for, who decided it's not for release? Well, it's, it was, it was um, I mean, this model's from OpenAI. So OpenAI, uh, according to their policies, they decided that they're going to try this as an example of what how, how to deal with sensitive, uh, very powerful models. So they're, they're also kind of testing their release process, which is they share the model with some institutions they trust, and the general public gets a dumbed down version. But wasn't this, sorry, just to counter that, wasn't this the purpose of OpenAI? And now if we're going to go up to GPT-20, yeah, that's why, that's why people were so, isn't this the purpose of OpenAI? How can you call it OpenAI if they're not releasing the models? That's the point of this, uh, this bug that they put, that uh, people have been liking on their on the repo. Um, but but uh, OpenAI, I mean, you might say their, their charter is really uh, to um, avoid malicious AI and have the best, encourage the best outcome for AI, as opposed to, uh, I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> Um, how does this do on question answering tasks like Pathy or uh, Squad or anything like that? So um, like, okay, so BERT would stomp at those. Uh, and uh, GPT-2 does, um, it, sorry, I don't have all the results in here, but uh, GPT-2 does, does pretty good, but I think BERT is the leader in that stuff right now. So, so in, in the zero shot sense, if I had a new domain that I'm working on, right, and I wanted to build a question answering system, that could I take something like GPT or Word off the shelf, uh, perhaps give it a few training examples from my domain, fine tune it, and then put it into production? Would, would it? Would you sort of advise that? I mean, see that from the results. I mean, the zero shot stuff is really cutting edge, and as you can see, sometimes you get results that don't totally make sense. They're encouraged that they get some results that make sense, but I, I wouldn't say today you would expect uh, production ready zero shot on anything right. here. But, it, but it's cool that it even does anything. I know, but I'm just wondering how good, how good is it or how good enough is it. Like, it's like some of the recycling text could totally go as fake news. Like, I would, yes. It, it, and it looks convincing. So. Yes. Like, if so, you can bullshit your way through the world, that would be awesome. Yeah, so that, the, that text is with the giant model that's so big, I, we can't even run it on our, our own system. Um, so, so that's where you get there. You're getting a really good quality path. The, the, the stuff that we can download today is is a little bit like the, the, the smaller model generated these rules here, which you can see kind of makes sense, but towards the end it starts kind of falling off. Way better than Markov chains. Uh, so for the small. Cool. Sorry, I think we need to cut this off and move on to the next okay. speaker. Thanks very much. Uh, overrun. Thank, thank you. Thank you.
it, if, it, if the screen goes blank, you have to hold it down for like five seconds, and then the light will come on. And you don't hold it down when you talk, you just like click it on. The, the spikes. All right, Mike, do you want to just introduce yourself and then jump in? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Mike Herbert. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about um, doing faster geospatial analysis for all. Um, so, when I was thinking about this talk, I was thinking, when I initially was designing this talk, I was thinking, like, along the lines of, oh, if you have this new rocket ship or something like that, then maybe I should try and take it apart and explain each individual piece and then put it back together at the end to show you what the final product looks like. And you would all probably learn a lot and would have a great time. Or I could just show you the outside of the rocket, show it launching off, and you could just infer where it might go afterwards, right? So that was kind of my motivation for how I should go about this. Um, so very, very little. I completely scan on any details here. So um, yeah, enjoy that. OK. Uh, right, so why do you need to do spatial models? This is uh, absolutely a uh, classic example. Uh, this is uh, from 1854. This is representing a cholera outbreak in the middle of London. Uh, it was mapped out by John Snow, not that John Snow. <laughs> uh, and so we, we, we can see that in the sensor here that there, there is a, uh, a source of water, and we can map out all the cholera outbreaks. And so something that's obvious here is there's a lot of clustering going on around some central point, and this was used to uh, used to identify that the, the color outbreak was actually coming from that central location. And this was actually before germ theory of, of, uh, germ theory of, of disease or anything like that. It was pretty amazing. Okay, so we want to do some ge geospatial analysis. More often than not, we might want to do some Bayesian geospatial analysis. Why is this hard? Because when we have to do something on the left, like MCMC, which is a type of sampling, uh, it's a bit like me saying we need to design a rocket ship and uh, we need to go and fly to every single planet uh, several thousand times to get a good snapshot of every single thousand, uh, uh, to get a good snapshot of like everything that's out there basically. Or we could do something on the, on the, on the right hand side like variational base which is uh, just you know get a satellite and park it in the Lagrangian point just outside of Earth. I mean that's a, also a hard task but it's not quite as hard as as this impossible side site line task on the left hand side somehow. Okay, so there is a way of doing this for geospatial modeling. It's called the uh, IMLA package, Integrated Nested Laplace Approximation. I won't explain any of that here. Um, but just to give you sort of uh, an insight, uh, on the left hand side is a graph representing uh, publications using, uh, using this approach. Um, and uh, going back to 2010, uh, on, on the right hand side, something sort of more close to my own heart is uh, these publications in public health and see sort of a nice general upward trend of uh, this application, and this is being used by practitioners who, be honest, aren't like really super into their Bayesian statistics, but are able to use this and apply this to actual data that they, they want to, that's relevant that they want to work on. Okay, so an example then of what I'm going to present uh, tonight was uh, just some, some data that I pulled out uh, about harbor seals, harbor seals um, uh, within British Columbia. So if you don't know, harbor seals work a, a bit of loony. I think, uh, is that they're a, a pair of pets, they're a type of, uh, they're a, a type of seal. Uh, they, um, they, they have pups around um, springtime, weaned after four weeks, and so often people want to like, try and capture where, where their locations are. Um, they typically live 25 to 30 years. Uh, they've been protected under the Federal Fisheries Act since 1970, but that means that recently they, their populations have started to uh, come back up again. 
And so uh, there's a obvious concern around, you know, what, what uh, populations do we need to bring back, population control, things like that. Okay, um, I don't know why I've got this slide in. Anyway, the range, <laughs> the range is, is in a, uh, Atlantic, Pacific. Uh, this is one of the oldest known examples of, uh, uh, oldest evolutionary examples of any seal. And it's actually in Canada. So it's discovered in uh, Nova, and it's actually on, on display at the Natural History Museum in Ottawa. And it's, it's the only known uh, example of that species. Anyway, okay, back to the task. So here's the data that I downloaded from an open data set along uh, BC Coast Life. Here it is. Uh, we have uh, we have some some counts here. We have obviously quite a lot of over dispersion here as well. You can see this is on a log scale. We have a lot of like zeros, a, a, a few that are 100 as well. Uh, maybe there's there's a pattern up here. It's hard to see what, what the pattern looks like though, right? So we want to create a model. Uh, some of the things we need to think about. We want to think about some of the covariates that are going into this. So the obvious things from the data that I have would be uh, say the latitude or longitude. Uh, we want to think about the underlying uh, count process, what that looks like. If I just plotted all the data, ignoring the spatial component, uh, and this is again on a log scale, this looks kind of log globally, maybe, or you know, maybe sort of negative by or something like that. Uh, we want to think also importantly about the spatial covariance. So how how uh, do these uh, spatial points relate to one another? Uh, and there's a there's a, quite a lot of boilerplate within this this package that I'm talking about. But essentially, your, your model would end up looking something like this. So if people are familiar with R, this looks very much like um, so like a typical kind of uh, GLM that you would write down. Okay. Uh, this is some, some sample results, right? So uh, anyone who's familiar with finite element method artifacting will uh, be able to tell me why this is slightly wrong. But anyway, it, it gives you enough to give a demonstration. Uh, so this gives like an underlying this uh, an underlying mean of uh, where all the counts of the uh, seals are for a given year. Uh, we can also plot some covariates on the left hand side, and it looks like you know both of our covariates are probably um, uh, probably quite strongly dependent upon where you can find seals. So to wrap up, then if you want to go find seals, go further north and go further west. Basically. <laughs> um, <laughs> But if you want to do some geospatial analysis, then I would uh, strongly consider using a package like RNAI and not having to mess around with MCMC, basically. So uh, thank you. I'm just going to play a, play a video of a seal underwater <laughs> while we answer some questions. Thanks. <laughs> That's amazing. So questions? Thank you for the presentation. Um, did you compare your results with, um, with with when you tried to do MCMC or, or Bayesian? I haven't, but um, I, in earlier in my presentation, I give a I, I glossed over it, but I give a, a link uh, that gives a sort of gentle introduction to the actual components behind uh, you know like why it's called IMLA, um, and they also include a sort of a test comparison between MCMC. There they're just doing a, um, a hierarchical model that I'm doing the spatial component, but there's a whole other sort of technical bit that goes into adding the spatial component. But I mean, as the, the, more your, the more your data increases, the more you're going to see the gates. Um, I don't know what the, the big air notation looks like, but it's, it's, it's very significant gates when you're sort of getting to over a thousand data points. So. Yeah, it would be interesting to see the difference, like in the in the results as well, like the, yeah, you buy it, you know. But yeah, yeah as no, I said, I'll, I'll check uh, out. The it's been done, yeah. But it, Great, it, thank yeah, you. It's big. Uh, yeah, I was wondering, are there any? Is there like a mask being applied so that it only touches water? Yeah, so um, that would be something you'd have to do. Um, so there's, it's the the package is is really quite in depth, and you could do this kind of. Finite element method style stuff. So if you've ever done like tried to solve a like partial differential equation model because you're trying to sort of look at heat flow around an object or something like that, it's a lot of those things you can think about. So you have to create some kind of a mesh. And so I could have masked the, the coastline and created a mesh that wraps around the coastline, but I didn't do that here just because I was just trying to get a work, you know, simple working example. But you know, that would that's definitely something that you would do as a bit of an apply it. And then that also means that you can think about uh, the spatial relationship, say, like for my example, say, like around an island as well. So you're you're including the fact that there's a longer distance to travel up as the crow flies. 
Uh, a question like along the same lines, I guess, but like, I mean, we're probably counting seals on the shore. Yeah, well, seals live like in the water also. And so, yeah, I, like, what would you recommend to just do about that? I, I mean, yeah, I did, I did go into the technical details of it. I mean, there's, there's also, I guess, <coughs> one year as well, so you'd also want to try and like factor in the, the I mean, ultimately, probably for something like this, you'd want to get into the years as well to see what the, the overall sort of trend looks like. Um, yeah, how do you factor in? I mean, so I've only sort of tacitly looked at projects like this, and they, they look at things like the type of habitat along the coastlines. They care about things like aspect and stuff like that if it's more sheltered more less sheltered uh, that's a strong that's a strong predictor um i don't know if they do any call out with in the water itself for this yeah so you might even consider just trying to collapse down your data into one dimension along a coastline or trying to go from there or something are there any other questions out there yeah um, so the, the other example data set I was considering was, was potholes in Chicago, but um, you get less cute pictures. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned something about artifacts that somebody who knew something would understand. Do you want to speak about those things? Yeah, yeah. So, um, no, can play the video again. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. That's good. Uh, yeah, so there's there's weird stuff happening here, right? This, this, when this is discrete component here. Um, so if you do sort of finite element method things, you have to sort of construct a, a mesh, and the mesh um, is I mean, short shorthand. The, the mesh will be smaller where things are changing more, and it'll be larger where things aren't changing. So there's things like that. there's ways of constructing the, the meshes, and you can do all this inside the package. But I just use the kind of default just to get some answers out for tonight. But you would. You would look at this and worry, and you'd go back and try to make your mesh a little bit uh, finer so that you wouldn't have these kind of artifacts. All right, if there's no more questions, let's thank the speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm trying to just introduce yourself and then get into it. Hey, uh, can you guys hear me okay? All right, so uh, my name is Anchan. I work at a startup called Synaptive Greenhub. Our uh, goal is to provide lifestyle interventions uh, for you to have a healthier brain. Uh, as a part of that, we're actually working with uh, assist like agents or chatbots, I think that's called it, as uh, something that will keep you on track to meet some of your goals. Um, I'm enabled by two extremely talented individuals who are in the room, uh, Joel and Casey are sitting right there. Um, so we've tried putting chatbots on into production. We're not so production ready yet, but the outline for today's talk is uh, we're using an open source toolkit called Rasa. It's rasa.ai. It's an open source dialogue manager. Um, I'll talk a bit about microservices, which is essentially breaking the components of this um, this open source package apart. Um, so everybody here knows what HTTP stands for. We'll talk about HTTP uh, endpoints and Docker. I'll touch upon what service discovery is, our experience with something called Amazon Elastic Container Service, what it, what that is, and then we'll move on to questions. Okay, so um, in pictures, uh, when you interact with the chatbot, um, you typically ask a question like, what's the weather like tomorrow? Um, you listen, you typically do this through some sort of interface like um, WeChat, WhatsApp, SMS, and so on. That's what the computer is at. Um, and then you want to convert this natural text into structured text. 
for, you, for which you use something called NLU, a natural language understander. Um, that kind of hooks up to uh, understanding what uh, the structured text is. And there is something called a dialogue manager which tries to predict what the bot is supposed to say in response to what the user has actually said. And then you sort of generate that text. In that process, now, uh, if, if the user adds a location, you're, you're typically querying something like an, uh, a backend or a database to retrieve location, blah, blah, blah. And then you sort of reply saying it's sunny tomorrow uh, in San Francisco or Vancouver at 20 degrees Celsius. Um, so the core of it, um, this is a bit of blurry detail. But the thing is, every time you need to do something, um, there's the NLU that is there. Um, but every time um, uh, the dialogue manager needs to predict the next action, it also needs to sort of take an action. So that's typically called an action server, right? That actually goes, queries your database, and comes back. Uh, depending on what the action <laughs> server does, the, the, the natural language generation uh, generates the output. Um, so, if you go onto Amazon's website for something called an Elastic Container Service, this is sort of we're, we're sort of introducing microservices. I know this is a huge diagram, but we'll probably come back to it during questions. Um, so, it's essentially if you had multiple components, each so this is components sitting on a private network. Uh, each component has an IP or, or a, something like a, a web address attached to it, so that one service can actually talk to the other service. It can be attached to the internet and so on. So what does Rasa look like? Um, so the dialogue manager in Rasa is something called Rasa Core, which actually is an LSTM prediction stuff. Uh, it needs to talk to a natural language understanding module. It sits on the same private network. And that's another module. Uh, the, the, the main dialogue manager also needs to talk to something called the backend, and it needs to talk to the actions. And this entire thing is exposed to the internet. Um, so this is why Docker comes in. Uh, each of these components, Kalasa, is now a microservice, essentially. And each thing is talking to the other thing using uh, hypertext transfer pro protocol. So each of this is an API endpoint. And you're, you're containerizing your natural language understanding. You're containerizing your uh, core, which is your dialogue manager, you're containerizing your action server. Um, uh, there's another box here which uh, is, a, is, a, is a component that comes from uh, wit.ai to sort of understand entities like dates and times. I'll just put that in called duckling. And container management. Containers die all the time. Uh, containers need to be managed, which is why you need a service like uh, the Amazon Elastic Container Service or Kubernetes. They're both contemporaries. Um, so if your load increases for a particular service, there's a management to scale it. Uh, containers die, so those need to be restarted. And containers run on computers in the cloud, like people might have heard of EC2, which stands for Elastic Compute Cloud. These are computers running on servers. On this slide. Um, so the advantages of Amazon's offering uh, is, is something we're using, uh, and these are perspectives of a startup. The advantage is that it's easy to set up. The disadvantages you see are fairly, at least uh, we, some of the pains that we've experienced is that there's limited standard open source tooling like Docker or Docker Compose um, that you can directly run. Then they have their own version of Docker Compose. Uh, so um, then you want to worry about introducing environment variables and stuff, which is pretty standard in Docker with using something called env files, uh, ECS, you have to do a lot of stuff to do simple things like that. There's a limited online community on like Kubernetes. Beware of vendor lock-in. We will try to sell you. If you want to manage your environment variable, they say use another product that we have. Uh, so there's lots of hoops to jump through to do simple things because the feature isn't available. No. Um, so now I can go into, in the Q&A time, I can go into any detail for any of these things. Right? Any questions? Sitting on the microphone, so I'll ask this question. Uh, it, like, I'm very ignorant of Rasa, let's say. Yes. But it would seem to me that they're like it's likely like a tightly coupled package of functionality. And so I see you specifically 
separated out this core and NLU. And I, yeah. I'd like to hear you justify that that design choice because it must be interesting. Uh, no, so that's a design choice taken by the uh, the people who the, the company who maintains the software because um, there are other packages like your dialogue manager can be anything, uh, but your natural language understanding unit could be just Rasa NLU. So what Rasa NLU is, you can use it on its own with its own container, probably with something like a dialogue flow. Right? So Rasa NLU is just a packaging of different other natural language understanding components. So you can train your own traditional random field uh, natural language understanding. Uh, it can talk to standard natural language understanding things like uh, like Duckling, which is very it's a it's a pre-trained model released by Facebook to uh, to recognize entities like dates and times and numbers and currency and so on. So it's it's just a it's just a package on its own that you can use it with another dialogue manager should you want. And these things have, let's say, like reasonably well defined and stable interfaces. Yes. Um, so Rasa actually under the hood can you have the choice of using Spacey. You have the choice of using TensorFlow, uh, something that they call TensorFlow embedding, but it's actually I think uh, ideas borrowed from the Star Space paper or an implementation of the Star Space paper. So it, it's using TensorFlow under the hood um, or NLU and LSD implementation. Or even standard cyclical NLU. I'm going to speak in here. Great. Okay. Um, I was just curious, the system that you're currently describing, is it capable of online learning? And if so, how would it do that? Uh, currently, it's not capable of online learning, but it can be. So the thing is, you can you can pull it. So right now, the way we've deployed it is we have a machine learning models built with the image. But the next step, and that's actually offers this, is that you can query your models from an, another HTTP endpoint, right? So that becomes your model server. And you can actually set that up to continually train. If you can pull out your data from ongoing conversations and have a process to do that, train it, push it there. This could be something like an S3 bucket or something like that. And then Yeah. Um, just have a question regarding ECS and Kubernetes. Um, yeah. I'm just kind of curious. I think um, you can either choose Kubernetes or ECS, and yeah. I'm just kind of curious in terms of your decision of why going with ECS versus Kubernetes, because I know the Kubernetes gets there's a quite a big learning curve, and yeah. I'm just wondering if that's really the only reason why you're not kind of shying away from it. That that was primarily a reason because the learning curve, just in terms of setup, uh, and kind of work with the interface, set up the, you know, some something equivalent of having logs and, you know, um, there's a lot of setup required and Kubernetes has its own learning curve for the maintenance of these things. Um, whereas Amazon allows you to, so even setting up things like what I call service discovery is basically having uh, these uh, HTTP uh, DNS entries, right? So uh, if I go back to, uh, Amazon provides a DNS service called Route 53. So it's baked into that ecosystem where you can see each one of these microservices has their own DNS entries and they have their own IP addresses. So if they're on a private network, it kind of comes baked in. Kubernetes, I think you have to set a lot, a lot of things up. Um, so that's the reason we went with uh, ECS. Just, I mean, it took us literally from asking what are these things to a day and a half, we had enough to this knowledge. But with the caveat that of all the now we're facing problems with all the disadvantages. Yeah. Uh, I think with Duckling, Kubernetes is a little difficult at the start. Once you get it set up, though, I know. have you looked at Rancher or anything like that so that you can control your clusters across the cloud? No. We have. We want to make it. I mean, ideally, you you'd want to make it cloud agnostic, but being a startup wanting to go to market. Yeah, like let me just get this thing up and running it now. But that would be the next thing to look at. You can even integrate streams for like live as the person chat instead of having to do HTTP. Yeah. You just have the same integrated yeah. stream put on Kubernetes engine on Google or AWS.
Any further questions? All right, let's thank Ong Chan. <laughs> All right, Jeremy, just introduce yourself and then get going. All right, sounds good. All right, hi everyone, I'm Johnny, and uh, today I'm going to be talking about animal identification with machine learning. Um, your mic might not be on. Oh, my bad. Should it be green? No, I think now it is. Cool. All right. Um, this is going to be a beginner-friendly talk, and that's mainly because I myself am a complete beginner. Um, I'm a software engineer at Axiom Labs. I'm an instructor at uh, Lighthouse Labs, and I'm also a developer for the Vancouver Aquarium. And that last one um, is, has more to do with what I want to talk about today, which is uh, identifying animals, because there are uh, over 58,000 animals at the aquarium from 300 different, uh, different kinds of species, and there are 2,000 people that visit every single day. And there aren't enough staff and volunteers to be able to answer all the questions and help people get educated about all the animals on site. So I wanted to kind of explore different ways um, to help people just kind of learn about animals on their own uh, using their mobile devices and different effects. And um, instead of just kind of hopping on Medium and finding the nearest tutorial, just copying and pasting code, I wanted to kind of dig deep and understand not just machine learning, but also how it's used in biology and ecology for classifying animals. I find the best way to do things. And it kind of brought me to these devices here. These are camera traps, and they're the most commonly used devices for uh, ecologists to uh, take lots of pictures of different animals in a non-intrusive way in order to analyze them. And it wasn't until recently that um, they've been using CNNs in order to automatically classify animals. And uh, just recently, uh, some scientists have used uh, data from the Serengeti project with 3.3 million images from different kinds of animals in Tanzania to train a ResNet uh, to identify 48 different kinds of animals with an accuracy of 97%. And um, through look looking at all the different kinds of studies up to that point, uh, there were several different takeaways uh, that kind of helped me understand what are the different kinds of strategies for kind of classifying animals. One is that transfer learning is not necessarily going to be more effective than training from scratch. It really depends on the kind of model you're training from. And then uh, also, instead of just classifying, it's good to have a multi-step process of one, first def defining whether or not there's an animal in the photo, and then um, classifying it if you find one, and also um, um, limiting pooling and downsampling is good because there can be lots of subtle differences. Because with an image like this, we can see the difference between a crow and a raven. But once you start downsampling, um, those subtle differences can be completely lost to a neural network, so it's important to, as much as reasonably possible, limit that. And then there's data augmentation, which is pretty intuitive. Um, transformation distortions. Hue is one thing that doesn't need to be distorted because typically animals of similar species will have similar colors, so distorting is not really going to add to that accuracy. And then also, um, most data sets are going to be very imbalanced, so there are different kinds of strategies for uh, basically addressing those different kind of distributions in your training process. And then uh, instead of just looking at the state of the art for animal classification, I also use um, a bit of research on how uh, different organizations are using classification for the masses, because that's kind of what I want to do, um, create something that anybody can use. And uh, there's a couple apps out there. Uh, some are commercial, some are non-commercial. Uh, the commercial ones are the ones that do offline classification, um, which because they're, off, because they're commercial, it was kind of hard to find out how they put it together. But doing some research on how um, 
cost application is done on mobile devices in a more efficient way. I came across uh, the mobile nets architecture, which is the most common one for doing uh, offline class application. Sorry, mobile class application. And uh, how it works is it's instead of doing traditional convolutions, it uses stepwise separable convolutions, which results in a slight loss in accuracy, but it's almost neg negligible. And there's a lot um, to be gained in terms of efficiency because of uh, the fewer calculations that are being used. So you have 13 of these stepwise um, convolution blocks across the entire model, along with a stop back at the end and the fully connected in the beginning. And when compared to different kinds of models, the mobile net has uh, a slightly worse accuracy, like almost negligible, but the calculations that are being processed are far fewer, and so it makes it ideal for running on mobile devices. That's the one that I used, and uh, lately I've just kind of been toying around with it. Um, I kind of tried it on my pets at home. <laughs> so I created a little device. I used um, a mobile net and converted TensorFlow lights, and then put it on a Flutter application in order to um, be able to identify animals in a two-step process. The first uses obvious detection to, the to find the general class of animals, so fish, bird, cat, or whatever. And then based on the um, Based on the bounding box, it crops the image and then passes that into the classifier to find the exact species uh, of the animal. Uh, ideally, I'd love to be able to do that all in one model, but I, have, I don't know enough TensorFlow to be able to do that yet, so if anyone does, I'm more than happy to hear your advice. Um, and of course, the next step after doing that is to solve the larger problem of um, figuring out how to get a good enough data set of all the different species in the aquarium in an efficient way and label it as so it uh, that different people can use when they visit the aquarium. And I think that's about it. I'm um, happy to answer questions to the best of my ability. Thank you so much. Uh, what is Flutter? Fl what is Flutter? Uh, Flutter is Google's framework for um, building from a little. Have you heard of React Native? It's basically the answer to that. So it's a, it's a framework for building devices for iOS and Android at the same time. Exactly, cross-platform. And just recently, you can build for the web as well. Could you go into a bit, bit of detail about what stepwise convolutions are? Because I haven't heard that term before. Stepwise convolution, yeah, of course. Going back to that slide. Um, so typically with a convolution, you have a kernel that uh, convolutes over all the different channels of an input, and then uh, with an output layer, um, but with stepwise convolutions, you don't have a single kernel. You have one kernel for every single uh, channel, um, and then each of those is convoluted. And then um, the output, which is three different channels, gets uh, combined in what is called a pointwise convolution, and then you just kind of repeat that for however many um, however many uh, channels you want to put for your output. Uh, this is, I'm going to keep it short because it's not a question, but there's actually an ongoing Kaggle competition, I think related to CDPR conference, and it's actually data from iNaturalist. Right. It's about fine grain classifications. I think they've deliberately chosen species that are like really hard to distinguish. And so that might be an interesting topic for anyone who's interested in this. Yeah, I think it's the third one actually. So iNaturalist, um, they have, they would have one of the apps that I uh, talked about. Uh, Anyways, but yeah, they haven't. They they've been. They have a lot of data available, and they have had three kind of competitions. Um, they haven't been as popular because they don't offer money uh, or points. Uh, but points. Some of the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but some people who are just really interested in it have um, have gotten into it, and that's actually where I got some of my ideas for like the different kind of strategies. But yeah, if anyone's interested, they actually have an ongoing competition right now. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, what what did you use for bounding box problem? Bounding box. Yeah. Uh, I just used mobile um, SSD mobile net, um, and that's yeah. Basically, I just took the pre-trained SSD mobile net from the uh, uh, model zoo and just uh, retrained it. You, you had the data for the bounding box before. Like you you made the data yourself. How did you find the data for the bounding box? Train the model. 
Oh, I just took a bunch of pictures of my turtle. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I just ran them on. Coordinate. Yeah, basically, that's about it. I just took a bunch of pictures and annotated it. It took a long time. I think the program that I used was called uh, Label IMG and just spent hours and hours. Oh. It's, it wasn't fun. <laughs> no, it wasn't fun. <laughs> Um, question was uh, regarding free training uh, regarding uh, transfer learning. You yeah. said it is not effective. Oh, no, I didn't say it's not effective. I'm saying it's not necessarily more effective. And the difference is, and that's something that I got from one of the last studies, the one by uh, the one by that last one, that 2008 study. They mentioned that transfer learning is not necessarily more effective. Uh, it really depends on the kind of model you're training from. So basically, they tested. Having um, with ResNet pre trained on um, ImageNet and found that basically, ImageNet has so many different classes, not really special, specialized for animals. Um, and so, they, they can't, there wasn't really much difference in like what they had if, if they had just trained the ResNet from scratch using their own data. So, really, it wasn't that conclusive, but they're saying that um, really. If you want to use transfer learning and have a chance at it, like it'll be more reliable if your pre trained model is specified to what you want to train it for. So, going from a pre trained model that's been pre trained on animals to one that's pre trained on similar animals, you have a better chance than if you just have a general pre trained model and then trying to specify it for animals. Yep. Uh, I wonder if you consider a uh, YOLO model for the bounding box problem that's pre-trained to already find the bounding boxes in the like yeah. YOLO 2 or something like that? Yeah, I, I was debating between YOLO version 2 and MobileNet. And um, to be honest, I just kind of went with YOLO, uh, MobileNet and stuck with it. I'm sure YOLO would have given me similar results. From what I saw in terms of the comparison, YOLO seems to be a bit better in terms of accuracy, while MobileNet seems to be a little bit faster. Um, so I just ended up going with the faster one. Then related, I wonder if it makes sense to consider like GAN model for this type of thing because you have very you have limited data. I wonder if maybe you know, in the audience maybe have a comment on this. You mean for augmentation? Yeah. For data augmentation? Um, yeah, well yeah. Using the yeah, for augmentation. I never actually heard about that. Uh, I, I've read a, from with a little that I know about uh, GAN just for like generating things, but I guess using that for data augmentation kind of makes sense. I, I haven't really read enough about it to see how it could apply to this, but it sounds pretty interesting. Yeah, this is a this this has recently been investigated to okay. to use GANs to augment data. So usually you do uh, flipping, rotations, and right. brightness, saturation, and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but people have been trying to do um, they train a GAN on, on a large data set. And then they input a random vector, and then you get a random image, which can be used as an augmented image. So you can use that GAN to increase your training set. Uh, and also, a comment on the 2018 paper, um, we had someone present that, and the, from, from what I believe, the main reason they found the pre-trained networks did not perform as well as the ones that were trained directly on the Serengeti data set was, the, was that their data set was already very large. Mm -hmm. So the benefits that the pre-trained network gave to them was kind of diminished anyway. Exactly, so yeah. pre-trained networks would make a lot of sense when your uh, main data set is way too small. Yeah. Um, then you can take up um, data um, any, any networks from uh, from ImageNet domain and then transfer it to your domain. So that would work. But you're right in the way that, um, yes, in this case, it probably won't help because you have a lot of data anyway. It's true, yeah. You're right. They had, three, they had over 3 million pictures, right. so at, at that point, Having a pre training is not really that much benefit. You're right. Exactly. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, really great talk. Good to have another more relevant review. <laughs> um, yeah, so thinking, is there a way that, like, if you're trying to get sort of data, is there a way to sort of citizen science it a little bit with, if you have a relationship with um, the aquarium of whether sort of like an in, an in between app where people can like take a picture and then try and try and sort of identify what the animal is? Um, That's something to think about. Uh, we haven't really, like, conversations haven't gone that far. Uh, but yeah, like having people who visit, because people love taking pictures of the aquarium anyways. I'm sure there are many people who would be willing to 
uh, help us identify either visitors or even volunteers. So yeah, that's, something, that's definitely an option. Any further questions out there? All right, hearing nothing, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you, Johnny. And that is it. Thank you all for coming out tonight. And if you'd like to give one of these fantastic lightning talks, come speak to me or my co-host, Matt. And otherwise, I'll see you at the Rogue, and we'll have some food and drink. Thanks, everyone. Oh, one more announcement. Uh, just a quick thing. Uh, could we get all these tables to go from like this three by one configuration to a two by two configuration? It's probably a better way of saying that. But just make those squares from these tables. <laughs> Okay, Okay, yeah. Uh, okay. So, I trade. Our life is more complicated than this. Well, yeah, yeah.